welcome to the Hoop Collective podcast. We talk about the NBA. It's Sunday afternoon, pre Super Bowl. Joining me from San Francisco, California, is a man who is on edge and wearing his Eagles logos. Philadelphia native, LA Lakers beat writer Dave McMenamin. Have a great day, Brian. Fly Eagles fly, baby. <laughs> you know, this pot is coming out tomorrow. People will know. Do you want to get your, are you willing to state your, I mean, I'm not going to pick the Chiefs, but are you willing to state a prediction? Um, I'm participating in a friend's Super Bowl box pool, so um, I will uh, lead with my wallet and my heart. And oh. I have uh, an Eagles uh, four and a Chiefs six. So let's go 24-16, low scoring affair, oh. Eagles win. All right. Okay. Hey, listen, man, I don't have a dog in the fight. I hope you, I hope they do win for you. I don't care. Although in my area, there's a lot of Chiefs fans. So um, Nick Friedel, uh, who at the moment covers the Brooklyn Nets. Hmm, I don't know about that. I'll continue. He will be joining us in a while. He's stuck in traffic for in New York. Um, Dave, the Lakers got a pretty nice win on Saturday night, beating the Golden State Warriors. Uh, no Steph, no LeBron, but the new Lakers players played. And we're in an interesting time now for the Lakers. There's still, you know, quite a few games out of position, but there's still time. But I really wanted to start with uh, Rob Palenka had a press conference um, on Saturday before the game. Um, and he had some interesting things to say. I wasn't really actually prepared for the way he framed the big trades that he made, but I wanted to know, I actually could probably talk about this for the whole podcast, but I wanted to hear the, what, what you thought and, and what Rob said about the trades. Well, we got a new Palinkaism. Uh, he coined the phrase in the moment that the Lakers did their business through pre-agency rather than waiting for the summer when they can try to attract uh, guys on the market through free agency. And honestly, the way he described it, um, there was a, a great deal of confidence and energy around the idea that we're going to have these group of guys moving forward. But if whatever reason, we these may next not. 26 <laughs> games don't work out, then we can kind of turn the page because they all come off the books. The only four Lakers on the books next season are LeBron, Anthony Davis, Max Christie, and Jared Vanderbilt. And the Vanderbilt and Christie contracts are, are, are very uh, cost efficient. You know, make Christie making less than two million, Vanderbilt's like four point five or something in that range. And whether you could move them easily if you needed to to create oh, more yes. space, or oh, yes. like those are high value for um, that compensation. And so, uh, listen, you look at the Lakers roster, Brian. There's only one guy on the roster who's thirty or older. In LeBron, everybody else is young. And think about last year's team: the geriatrics with Rondo and Bazemore and Melo and uh, Dwight Howard, and you know, right on down the list. They've completely turned things over from there. And you know, I think the one thing that concerns me, because I do like the mix of talent and and I do like the direction they're going in, but when you have all of those guys that theoretically come off the books. That means you have all of those guys that are going to be free agents that want to make money. And that can lead to uncomfortable situations. Uh, I, I think they better do their work in these next 10 games. Make up the gap now. Go 7-3, 8-2, something like that, where then you feel on stable footing. Because otherwise, you're going to be in that hyper-energized, hyper-pressurized march towards the playoffs over those last 15 games and then personal agendas come in because guys want to make money and then it can go awry it's time to knock that new business idea out of the park with shopify the all-in-one commerce platform to start run and grow your business forget the off-season work shopify makes it simple to sell to anyone from anywhere whether you're selling warm-ups or wall hangers it's time to start selling with shopify and join the platform simplifying commerce for millions of businesses worldwide. With Shopify, you'll customize your online store to your brand. 
discover new customers, and build the relationships that create those diehard fans. Shopify fields all the sales channels to grow winning business. From an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform, even across social media platforms like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. And thanks to 24-7 support and free on-demand business courses, Shopify is on your team every step of the way. It's how every minute new sellers around the world score their first sale with Shopify, and you can too. Shopify is the secret to becoming a business champion by making it simple for anyone to sell their products anywhere, taking the guesswork out of selling. When you're ready to take your winning idea to the world, team up with Shopify, the commerce platform powering millions of businesses down the street and around the globe. Try out Shopify for free today and start selling anywhere. For the ones who get it done, Granger offers high quality supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as access to product specialists who have the knowledge and experience to answer your toughest questions. Plus, their commitment to being your safety partner can help you keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call or click Granger.com or just stop by. Well, real quick, uh, Nick Friedel joining us from New York. Sorry, Nick, we had to go because Dave has a whole plan built around the Super Bowl today, as you can understand. I would expect nothing less. Yes, sir, <laughs> baby. Listen, when your team's in it, I don't blame you. It's, it's, it's big. I watched the game with Nick when we got into the Super Bowl, so it's, it's hopefully a good luck charm seeing his uh, – There you go. His a real game. thriller we watched in the NFC title game. Wow. I'll take, a, I'll take a game just like that today, baby. <laughs> I bet you will. <laughs> just knock out every quarterback <laughs> they've got. Goodbye, I'll Pat Mahomes. Say goodbye, Chase Daniel. See ya. Um, so I would say, you know, the thing about pre-agency, pre-agency, I wouldn't say coin the term. It's been around for a while. It's when like a player like you know, a year or two away from free agency declares he's not going to resign. And so the team trades him, but I understand what Plinka was saying, which is that he got the team better now get off my back. Uh, but also I'm not locked into this roster. Like I was locked into the roster when Westbrook was here. And I think that's true. I think if this was a deal, if he's, if he could have put this team together to start the season and not carry around the 50 game, record that they have, you know, they're five games under 500. They're car- they got to carry that around. They got to carry all those losses around from the, from the poor way the team was constructed. And, you know, really it was to start the season when they were two and 10, that's what they're, that's what they're carrying around. Um, they were, you know, they've, they're three, three games, games over, over 500, 500 since then. Yeah. Right. And three games over 500 had they just gone five and five in those games. And I know that's a big if, but they had, they had just been 500 in those first 12 games. Uh, three games over 500 right now is sixth place. Uh, that's where the Clippers are, and they're in sixth place right now. So um, it's not unreasonable to think that this team, with this roster being significantly better designed, would be a, a, in fifth or sixth place right now had these trades happened at the beginning of the season. And I think it's relevant to say that uh, it's okay to congratulate Rob for doing these deals, but it's also okay to say, you know, you were five months too late. Um, the thing that uh, – so so – Malik Beasley has a team option. So that's a really valuable uh, thing to have. He, they can let him go if they think that they need to open the space um, or they can, um, they can, uh, uh, you know, keep him if they want to keep him. It's like 16 million, right? Around 16 million, which yeah. is a good. And you can, and you can, in. you could even extend the contract or you could come to an agreement with him. If you want to keep him, um, you're not supposed to do this, but it happens all the time you let the team option expire and then you sign him to a new contract um, that you can do because you have his bird rights. Um, and Hachimura, like they did trade two sec or three second round picks for him. So ideally because you've invested that draft capital um, you don't want to let the player go, but they hit a home run on that trade for Thomas Bryant, where they got three second round picks for him. That's a guy they signed on a minimum who they flipped at the deadline for three second round picks. For all of the times that uh, Palenka has been, uh, you know, you know, raked across the coals for, um, you know, mistakes, that was good business. And so that eases, they did trade basically one pick for Mo Bamba, um, who they're bringing in. Uh, so it, they don't turn up square, but they, 
but you know, really the net cost in terms of second rounders, and you're you're not even thinking so much about the players you can draft. You're thinking about the players that you know, thinking about those as as trade assets down the line. I don't feel as bad about it as I would have, um, bef- you know, if, uh, you know, if, if, you know, they just let them walk. So they could just say, Hey, thanks Rui and let them walk. I mean, it's not great, but if they thought they could use that free agent money another way. So I agree with all of that. I just think it came too late, Dave. Um, but also can you, can you let us give us a feel of just how significant this LeBron foot injury is? He's now missed a couple of games in a row. I got why he skipped Thursday's game. Um, but you know, this foot, you know, is, you know, any of their hopes and dreams are tied to that. So what's that situation? The first I heard of it being something that really gave me pause and okay, this is more so than something that he'll just kind of work through was after the New Orleans game when he played 40 minutes which was last uh, weekend. Last weekend. It was the third time on that road trip, I believe, he played 40-plus minutes. Now, two of them were overtime games, but still, 38 years old, 20th season, 40-plus minutes on the regular. And you know, some of the speak people I speak to were, like, around the team, let's put it that way, were like, what, what are we doing here? Playing him 40 minutes again? Like, are we going to run him into the ground? And it's not the minutes necessarily. It's the minutes while a player is dealing with something that's been pervasive. Uh, You know, the things we see in the locker room are, you know, him getting it stretched out by it's his left foot. Uh, The the team's terming it a left ankle injury. But to me, from what I've seen, the modalities and and having someone from the staff work on it, it appears to be the foot more so the ankle. Uh, the, it was so serious that he went for an MRI this week, which came back clean, which is good. But Darvin Ham said there was one area of irritation, um, kind of vaguely. <laughs> so we don't don't really know what that means. You go a lot of different but, ways with that. <laughs> but uh, you know, I I don't think he's going to miss the All Star game. I don't think he's going to miss these next two games uh, prior to the All Star break. He could miss the Portland game. At least the Salters reported on the Saturday night broadcast that uh, perhaps the Pelicans game at, at home is more likely. I reported that the Portland game is 50 50. But I, I believe that it's not so bad that, you know, we have to worry about him missing a swath of time unless something additional happens to it additional flare up, additional injury on top of it. Uh, and there's a motivation from him to be on the court with these guys, with the new faces, at least once. So everybody has that in their mind as they head to the, the All-Star break. Well, let me say something about that New Orleans game. Obviously, it was a disappointing way they lost that New Orleans game last weekend. I believe, and I may have to have Jackson edit this out later, but I believe today the Pelicans are going to announce that Zion had a setback in his recovery from his hamstring <laughs> And that he is going to be, I don't know if they're going to say, but I do believe it's going to be weeks. I don't think it's like, you know, he's going to miss the all-star game and he's going to um, potentially miss some time after that. Um, The Pelicans are in sixth place. I know seventh place, seventh place, one game over 500. Um, They have struggled without Zion, although um, they did win a couple of games. They had the long losing streak, and they won three in a row. Uh, they're playing right now at home. Actually, maybe they're playing later today at home. They're playing before the Super Bowl at home. Um, actually, I'm not. I'm wrong. They're not playing today. So, apologies to that. Uh, but I think the announcement's going to come today. So, it just um, came out, real oh, time. Yeah. David Griffin says Zion Williamson reaggravated his hamstring injury. He's looking at missing multiple weeks post All Star will be reevaluated yeah. when they get back from All-Star Game, according to our Andrew Lopez. Okay. Goodbye, Pelicans. Right. See you. You think so, Nick? That's it. I, how can you trust this guy to stay on the floor, sadly? Well, look, Zion is Zion. They, I don't know. They did play a little bit better these last couple games. Um, I think their schedule softens after the All-Star break. They've had a tougher schedule, but their margin for error is gone. I mean, they were in second place 
when he got hurt. Maybe they were actually in third when he got hurt, but at one point they were in second. And now they're, you know, outside, they're in the play-in zone. Um, but if I'm the Lakers, you know, if I'm the Lakers, I'm sitting there, Dave, and I'm saying, okay, well, the Jazz, um, you know, they specifically are not, I mean, you know, they're going to win some games because they still have talent, but, you know, that trade, you know, knocked down their rotation. They, they took out three rotation players. I, I, they were already backsliding. I, I do not see the Jazz um, remaining in that position. So I think, mm-hmm. you know, they're sitting there at um, 11th, a uh, half game right now behind the play-in spot. I think the Lakers are passing them. So these next two games, they play Portland. I don't know if LeBron's going to play, but they really should try to win that one. And um, uh, I think Jeremy Grant is likely not to play Monday because he's in concussion protocol. So they should really try to get those next two games before the, before the break. And they're now, then they're, then they're looking up at new Orleans, maybe coming back at them. So like, you know, the LeBron injury thing is, is, is significant, but their positioning isn't, all things considered, it's not so bad. I mean, I, I think I like their chances, barring this LeBron injury being severe and barring Anthony Davis injury. I like their chances of getting into that play in zone. Yeah, I mean, listen, they have set a team goal for themselves after 52 games to finish the season 20 and 10, which I was almost knocked out of my chair when I first heard it talked about openly. <laughs> I mean, usually we take it one game at a time, right? <laughs> <laughs> admitting that this is what wow. they're going for. Uh, the problem is, one, because they waited this long to make their moves, another ill-timed injury and they're kaput. And two, some of these teams above them have gotten better. And so, like, you know, maybe you could steal a game from the Suns uh, in another scenario, but, you know, now they're – retooled Mavericks retooled uh Pelicans excuse me Clippers retooled um some of these teams are going to be a harder out I think that they're yeah, Minnesota's they're, getting Carl Towns back and they just got yeah. Mike Conley you know they, right. they're upgrading so what about reason number three they're just not good enough to go 20 and 10 well I mean uh, you could say you could say that you could also say they beat the Grizzlies on an 11 game winning streak they beat Sacto in Sacto. They played Boston to a standstill twice, the best team in the league. They beat Milwaukee in Milwaukee when they were 15 and five, but welcoming back. That was, that was pretty much their best win of the year in Milwaukee. So, I mean, you could say that, Nick. You could also say at their best, they've looked pretty good this year and they've gotten better. Uh, all those games I just mentioned were, were pre having these, these new pieces. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I it's it's difficult to there's nuance to talk about the Lakers because you know if you say you're bullish on them, they say, well, they're in 13th place. I go, yeah, well, I'm bullish on them to get to the plan. I don't think it's that uh, I don't think it's that hot of a take. Nick, well, when you see the Lakers now, do you do you see them as a team that gets the play in and scares anybody? Not really. LeBron's still LeBron, and he's been as good as you could have hoped at this stage, but Dave and I were just having this conversation the other day at the game we were sitting at. (laughs) It's like outside of LeBron, I don't trust Anthony Davis to stay healthy. I like some of the moves. I know you guys went through them, but I see a team with LeBron and still not that much else to put a scare in anyone. If you have LeBron James on your team, it's always going to be, all right, well, what can he do? And who can he pull with him to make something happen? But as far as making any kind of noise, I, they've been too inconsistent for me to believe that they're going to be able to hit that switch and, and get rolling here. Um, did you, Dave, do you look at them and say um, that had this roster been, like I was saying at the start of the season, that this could have been a contending team? I already have the answer. I I was going to say, that's the answer. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, just because there's the butterfly effect of things. You wonder if they had more help from the start that something like 
the LeBron wear and tear doesn't happen as much. I know he's year 20 regardless, but yeah, the, or the Anthony Davis foot injury doesn't flare up uh, to the extent that it did. And so then you're like, would they be a contender with this group from day one? Maybe not, but because the West is so soft, you know, relatively to years past, they could have won, I don't know, they could be 10 games over 500 with this group from day one. Day one. Yeah, again, even if they are 500 in the first 10 games, they're in fifth place. One more thing before we move on. When they talk about pre, when, when Rob Plinka talks about pre-agency, is this just a coded way of talking about going after Kyrie Irving? <laughs> yeah, or I mean, there, I asked, yeah, I asked him about it straight. Like, you know, uh, how much did the pursuit of Kyrie Irving uh, affect everything uh, over this last week or so? And he said that the rules of the league prevent him from speaking about players on other rosters. Uh, Sure, uh, but it, it's easy to discern that there is interest, there has been interest in Kyrie Irving dating back to the summertime, uh, like spiked interest dating back to the summertime. And Kyrie's introductory press conference with the Mavs, he acknowledged that you can't think about what could have been or what should be, I believe was his wording, <laughs> suggesting that he should be yeah. with the Lakers. And so... He's going to love the one he's with, with the Mavericks right now. And we'll see where that goes. Kyrie Irving, to my understanding, uh, he wants a basketball fit, but he's very much interested in uh, long-term security with this next contract. And if he can get the number and the basketball fit in Dallas, like I don't see him bouncing this summer. Uh, but if that goes sideways for a reason, and the Lakers you – know, think about this, the Lakers – they started this wheel of moves after they lost in the first round of the playoffs to the Suns. So let's say this group like looks okay over this final stretch, makes it into the play-in, makes it into the first round, loses in the first round. Is that good enough? Because we just saw a couple of years ago it wasn't good enough. So you had to make major moves. So if you lose in the first round with this group, which would actually be an accomplishment. For oh my God. Stand, if they right? get to the first round, I would shake their hand. Right. That would be an accomplishment, but is that enough to stop from looking behind door number two and ushering in Kyrie Irving, if he's willing to take what would amount to be a discount based on, on you know, the reports of what he was seeking in Brooklyn. Did you ever get your storybook? Goodbye. Friedel with Kyrie. Your what were you guys going to be going to kumbaya? What was the we were gonna uh, hug? Oh, hug. No, that did not happen. Like many other That's things sh- that the Nets had hoped would happen during that time, <laughs> that didn't happen either. Well, the like thing I'll say other about op- uh, other many other opportunities for physical affection that did not happen for Nick Friedel. I mean, <laughs> playing the role of Tim McMahon seems, on that seems the Hoop cool Collective today. Yeah, I mean, it's just <laughs> channeling band. <laughs> in this moment, Dave McMenamin, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will say this. Typically, when you look at a star player hitting free agency, you say to his, um, you say, well, he can get more money or more years staying with his, you know, the team that has his rights. So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's an issue here because I don't think there's any circumstance that he's getting five-year contract from the Mavericks. If the, I think if the Mavericks go to the finals, I don't think he's getting a five-year contract. And so it's not like, oh, well, the Mavericks are going to offer five and the Lakers can only offer four. Like, I'm not even so sure that anybody's going to be willing to offer three fully guaranteed. So that's the one thing. Like, even if it does go well, whichever team has the, you know, fortitude to maybe put the least number of, you know, limitations or, or lack of guarantees in the Kyrie contract might get them. So like it almost isn't even that relevant how it goes in Dallas because, you know, and again, I'm not, I'm going to go over actions, not words because Nick, we were just watching the nets going just fine. And, you know, granted they were hitting a bump in the road with, uh, with Durant out, but they had won 18 of 20 and Kyrie was playing great. And that did not keep him there. He, it was about the money. In the end, this guy who, you know, tries to make it seem like it's not about the money 
And by the way, the guy is extremely generous to charity. I'm not saying he's looking to make sure he can upgrade his jet. I'm just saying it is about the money in the end. And if he was willing to blow up what he had in Brooklyn uh, and the opportunity they had this year because he wasn't comfortable with the extension, I think at the end of the day, it's going to come down to what the Mavericks are willing to offer, what the Lakers are willing to offer. B, you're 100% right. And as far as Kyrie is concerned, it's always actions speak much louder than words because two days before we find out about the, the trade request, he's sitting in Boston saying, hey, I love what we're building here. We're building a, a family. We believe that we can contend for a title this year still. We're going to get Kevin back. Boom. <laughs> it's all over with. So just forget what Kyrie says as best you can most of the time. He wants to get paid. That is his right as an NBA player, as a star in the league who people show up to see every night. If I'm another team, having watched what's occurred and all these stops that we've all seen firsthand, I'm not giving him anywhere close, anywhere close to any kind of max or four years or five years. Give me well, he's going to get max dollars. I think he's a max dollars player. Oh, no question. But I mean, max yeah. years. Max, how could you, how could you commit max years given what we've seen over the last few years? You can, I don't think the Lakers can even create max dollars for him. It would have to be a discount. Am I not necessarily? First off, they can create a big, port, big salary cap space and they could also do a sign and trade. Sign and trade. Um, okay, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, some of these players that they got, this is what um this is what Rob is sort of talking about, maybe without talking about it. I mean, like, I'm not saying he's he's acquiring these players to trade him for Kyrie or trade him for somebody else, but he talked about optionality. Well, that's one of the options. Option A may be re, you know, these guys look great. Maybe they do go 20 and 10. You know what? Maybe they go 18 and 12 and they get knocked out in the play, and maybe they get you know the ninth spot. They win the first playing game, lose the second game, and they go, you know what? Let's give this guys an 82-game run, and they they keep him back. Maybe the Mavericks don't want to lose Kyrie Irving for nothing, and they're like, okay, we'll sign and trade, and we'll take Malik Beasley or we'll take um, uh, Vanderbilt or you know, whatever off your hands in you know, combination, and then the sign and trade does. Yeah, you, you are right. The, but right now, the Lakers do not have max space. And it's not as simple as just saying they could sign Kyrie. There would have to yep. be machinations done, but but they are not locked in. They they have optionality, like like Palenka said. Um, okay, Nick, uh, you covered the first Nets game last night with the new players. Uh, they had a close loss against Philly. James Harden's first game back in Brooklyn <laughs> since a year ago. He has to be traded. I, I hear it before we even start the conversation because it was so unbelievable. How quick everything just – hey, James, <laughs> what, what, what do you think like about being on that? Oh, he, he had been waiting. He had All right, been so waiting. tell us tell us the story of the post-game interview. So we're in the Sixers locker room, and our friend Brian Mahoney from the AP asked the first question to Harden. <laughs> the first question – and Brian was just trying to get the ball rolling. Over the by the way, the Sixers of- win. Harden had 29 points. He, it, you know, it was a good. He they were they were doing. It was a tight game, but they won. And and let me just say, because I don't know how much more Nets talk before we get in this Harden story. I like their new team. They are going to defend. They're going to play hard. They're going to be fun to watch. They don't have stars. Stars win in the NBA. And and wait, don't they have Ben Simmons? No. He, Ben Simmons, who comes off the bench now and is has almost eighty million left on his oh. deal for two more years. That that deal. Oh, I, anyway, I don't want to get sidetracked off Simmons uh, uh, with Simmons' conversation. I like the Nets. Mikael Bridges is a hell of a player. Seeing him up close now, uh, there's hope that he can turn into an All Star. They're going to need to add pieces, and they got a bunch of picks. But I like the way that team is coming together in the wake of the breakup of the the best team that never was in this era. Okay, we're in the Sixers locker room. Everybody's feeling good. The Sixers just got another win off a back-to-back. And (laughs) Harden is standing in front of us. And there's only like, I don't know, eight reporters, seven, eight reporters. There weren't a lot of people in there. 
And our friend Brian Mahoney from the AP goes, James, trying to get the ball rolling. Did you ever think in any scenario that you would be back here playing against the Nets and Kevin and Kyrie would be gone? And without any hesitation, Harden goes, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) At which point we're like, oh, 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 here we go. He spoke for about four or five minutes and he – he was very frustrated, not just that uh, about the, the tenure in Brooklyn and how it didn't work. It was interesting, though, guys, because the consensus and talking to the other writers is after we walked out and listened to him uh, c- crush the situation and crush the fact that the organization didn't do more to try and bring him back. The person he was talking to was Kyrie Irving. That's what I, I just wanted to make sure that's what my read on his quotes, not having been there reading the quotes. I mean, he didn't absolve the nets, but, but my read on it was that he was basically saying this is Kyrie's fault. A hundred percent was my read to stand in there. And that goes for context and all of this to what all the people in the nets organization feel. <laughs> I mean, that's why I like, do I think there was frustration with, with KD at the very end, especially after what occurred over the summer? Sure. But there was a respect level that Kevin had come in there every day and as the star of the team had put in the work to earn the respect from top to bottom in the organization. Kyrie, it's all been well documented. He just, he just could not be counted on to be out there every night. And as far as Harden goes, I think Harden, the big takeaway for me was that Harden hated the fact that people were saying James Harden quit on the Nets. But see, guys, this is where both things can be true. Because James Harden, in those last few games, I was sitting there in Sacramento about a year ago. He, he just he, he quit. He stopped playing for that team. Quiet quitting, it was, I believe they call it these quiet days. Quiet quitting. He, he wanted out. He had, he had had enough. But see, this is where you have to remind everybody. Harden, two weeks before that, or three weeks, whatever it was, was in Chicago <laughs> after Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and James Harden had just demolished the Bulls, who at the time were at the top of the East. And he's sitting there saying, we can beat anybody. We know how good we are. This is our time. A couple days later, Kevin Durant injures his knee. He's out for six weeks. Kyrie Irving can't play in New York City because he doesn't have the, the vaccination. And James Harden, between Kevin getting hurt and Kyrie not being available, said, I am out. It was Harden who said, I'm going to give Kyrie the shot myself. That, of course, never happened. And the rest is history. But Harden, as frustrated as he was and as honest as he was in the moment on Saturday night, he can't have it both ways because he's saying, oh, people call me a quitter. I'm not a quitter. But he had given up on that team. The issue, though, to me is he's pulling the curtain back on how much frustration there is and will continue to be for a while with Kyrie. And be the the other thing I think it is important to point out and why Harden decided to say what he said last night. It wasn't just that they he was back in Barclays for the first time. If you go back in the last few weeks, Kyrie Irving and Nick Claxton specifically kept saying, we have guys on this team this year, right now, who are committed to the team. We didn't have that as much last season, which many, many people took as a shot to James Harden because he had decided to disappear. So Harden heard all this stuff. He knew what was happening. He knew that all these trades just happened, and he wanted to get his point across. He wasn't talking about Patty Mills, you don't think? I don't think he was talking about uh, – Utah? It wasn't Utah? It wasn't Utah. (laughs) It wasn't Patty Mills. And, I mean, people – People will say, oh, well, Claxton and Kyrie could have been talking about Blake Griffin or LaMarcus Aldridge from last year. Sure. Okay. (laughs) Well, but they were also talking about James Harden because in the end, guys, and Dave, this goes back to the Simmons point. In hindsight, the Nets would have been better off to try and call James Harden's bluff and say, oh, just wait. The vaccination stuff may turn. Kyrie may play all the time. Kevin's coming back off his knee injury. Just see what happens at the end of the year. Even then, Harden walking would have been better than taking on Ben Simmons, who just isn't a very good player right now. It's, it's sad because you've 
we've all seen how good he can be when physically he's right, when mentally he's feeling good. He's neither of those things right now. He's not close to being a max player in the NBA, and he's still on a max deal with two years left. So that Simmons contract and the context around with which he was acquired by Brooklyn needs to get way more attention because in the end, it's one of the biggest reasons why the Nets couldn't make a move after trading Kyrie to get back any kind of pieces that would have made Kevin Durant want to stay, even if he had thought about staying in Brooklyn longer than a few days after the deadline. So the new look Nets, they're starting Spencer Dinwiddie, Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, Nick Claxton, and Dorian Finney-Smith. Dorian Finney-Smith. And they're bringing Cam Thomas, the 40-point 40, 40 man, off the bench. Um, what's Where is that team going this year? First round and out. I think they'll – They'll get into a first round series. They're not good enough to win one right now without one of those stars. Doc Rivers made it. So, an interesting so same point, as guys. they were last year. It's the same as they were. Doc Rivers made an interesting. Maybe point, win though. a game this year, though. Yeah, they, <laughs> they they might be able to do that. I think so. But Doc said it takes time for guys to learn how to play late in games. He said he went through this when the Clippers were going through their reshuffling. You've got a ton of young, talented players, but you don't have those guys at the end of games who know what they need to do and can hit those shots. Right now, I would tell you all, I think Bridges can be that guy. I think there is another level within his game that he can hit, and the Suns people adored him. I mean, they love him. They did not want to move him. And if you have all those picks, the hope for the Nets is – Bridges continues to get better. Maybe you develop one of those picks over time or you take all those picks and the assets and trade for whatever the next star coming down the trade block may be. But uh, there, I cannot stress to you all enough how many times I heard in the last 48 hours, the vibes are so much better here. (laughs) I know, but the team's not as good. I mean, but the team's not as good, but, but that all, as we know, it all factors into A larger discussion, because I don't think any one of us thought the Nets, even with Kevin and Kyrie, were going to win a title this year. But they had a shot with both those guys on the roster. They now no longer have a shot to win a title, but up and down the organization, everybody is significantly happier that they're not dealing with all the extra drama that came, especially with Kyrie. So How does that balance out in the end? You need stars to win. They don't have them, so they're not going to win at a very high level, but they have a good base and a young team that figures to improve. Okay, so don't they sound, Brian, just quick interruption. I apologize, but don't they just sound like. Montemps never apologizes. He just blasts right through. So (laughs) I I want to thank you. Montemps interrupts. I would do everything I possibly can to avoid (laughs) any comparison to that man. The front of me is right again, baby. Love you, Timmy B. B. Uh, But don't they just sound like they were prior to Katie and Kyrie then? Like, we're just back. Yeah, it's it's Jared Allen and and Joe Harris. Spencer (laughs) Dinwiddie. Spencer Dinwiddie, Joe Harris serving as the bridge, the big brother on on both teams. That's exactly what it is. It's, It's a redo of what we just saw. And... This is what every NBA front office goes through because there's always going to be talk. Oh, we got to build our culture and we've got to put things together and we've got to get guys to believe in what we're doing. Well, then the next star is going to come around and you're going to say, I got to get that star. And this is the fascinating part about building an NBA team because you cannot win a title without stars. You can't, it, it just doesn't happen. And as far as the Nets are concerned, I do think they're going to be a lot happier team over the next couple months, but they're not going to be able to get to that next level until they acquire a guy who, who they don't know who that is right now. I will say the irony is, is that, you know, I had made it a rule at the beginning of this season, not to talk about the Nets or the Lakers. And here we are talking about the Nets and Lakers. I've, I've yielded, I've waved the white flag. Um, but I think the Nets are going to be moving through that zone. Let me say, Nick, um, I think that the that the Nets 
I, I find it hard to believe that they could have gotten more in this in uh, in this trade. Now, it was a closed market. Uh, Ramona Shelburne and I wrote a story about um, about the machinations of the trade that published Friday. You know, Adrian Wojnarowski reported on it throughout the week. He was the first one to sound the alarm. I think on Tuesday when he reported that they had had some tough conversations um, in the wake of the Kyrie Irving trade, which was like, you know, the tremor before the earthquake, essentially. Um, and I think had it been an open, an open bidding war and teams actually were bidding, I'm not sure they could have gotten, I mean, I think there would have, obviously the Nets would have preferred to get a guy like Scotty Barnes. Mm -hmm. Maybe they could have, you know, like if they had made it, I, I, I thought the Pelicans were always a, an option team. You know, I don't think they could have gotten Brandon Ingram, but, you know, I, I don't think they would have done it. I just like, I don't think Scotty Barnes would have come. So the fact that they got Bridges in the deal and the four firsts, and, and by the, the way, swap. they got, yeah, and the swap. And the other way, by the way, they got Jay Crowder. Now, I know that Jay Crowder isn't going to hold up the deal. He did actually hold up the deal because the, the Suns, you know, were trading all this picks. They had a separate deal they could do with Milwaukee. We know that Milwaukee ended up doing the deal with the Nets for five second round picks. And then they used two of those second round picks, two or three, but they ended up rerouting some of them to pay for the uh, Pacers to take the players off their hands. They took Serge Ibaka, Jordan Awara. I don't even remember who else was in that deal to take their space, but the Nets got five second round picks. So, they, so they really, they got four first rounders bridges, Johnson and five second rounders. Uh, that's a higher price than, than, than they were willing to pay last summer. It's a higher price than anybody's willing to pay. That's the kind of ask that was making there be no traction on trades because the ask was so high that teams were like, we can't, we can't go forward with this. So I actually think that the nets and I do, I absolutely think that the new owner played a role. I think the biggest role was he was willing to take on the salary cap implications of this it, it cost him in the neighborhood of 40 million dollars extra in tax now, i don't know robert sarver's mind maybe robert sarver in that particular situation would have said okay i'll it's kevin durant i'll pay the 40 million he he had paid 14 million dollars in tax in his 19 years as owner total but they were going to pay more this year they, they were in the tax this year for the first time in I believe 12 years, but okay. You know, I don't know. I, what, what I say is the actions and Sarver wouldn't do that. I absolutely think that the new owner, Matt Ishbia desire to be competitive instantaneously played a role. I don't think that they get that deal. If Ishbia is not the owner, they, he may end up in Phoenix, but I don't think they don't, I don't think they get that deal. It's not right so, now. Right. Um, in the wake of that, here is what off the top of my head, the Nets got, for these three players that with the trades that they made in the last year. And if I'm missing something, please step in. So they traded Kyrie Irving, James Harden, and Kevin Durant for Ben Simmons, Seth Curry. I'm going to include Royce O'Neal because they took one of the first round picks that yeah. they got from Philly and, and, and flipped it to Utah. So I'm going to include that Royce O'Neal, Mikhail Bridges, Dorian Finney Smith. Spencer Dinwiddie, Cam Johnson. Those are the players, okay? And then from a pick standpoint, they got they have one first rounder left from uh Brooklyn, right? Because they flipped one of them. Or do they have two first rounders left from Brooklyn? I I mean from Philly. From Philly. From, yeah, I think they I I thought they had them both, but I Okay, they I, have two. Okay, they have they yeah, have this they, year had, they like got two off that deal. Two future first rounders. Okay. Two and then they picked up four, so six first rounders, and then they got one from Dallas, so seven first rounders. Um, did they get a but pick you said swap one from went Dallas? to Utah, right? You said one went to Utah for O'Neill, yeah. But I think they have seven first rounders okay. after the O'Neill one, after even after the O'Neill trade, but they have seven first rounders and five second rounders. I think they got one second rounder from Dallas, so I think six second round picks. And I, I can't remember if they got a swap from Dallas, but basically that's it. Those players and seven first round picks and then a couple of swaps and, and a bunch of second rounders that we really don't know what their value is here. In a vacuum, that is a classic example 
of a dollars for quarter situation. I don't know who coined this phrase. I know Bill Simmons popularized it. They always talk about in the NBA, four quarters doesn't make a dollar. So you take a player who's a star, a dollar, you trade him for four quarters. It's not the same. The, the Nets went from having a pile of dollars or a pile of hundreds, however you want, and they broke it down into a bunch of quarters or a bunch of 20s, however you want to call it. Um, Nick, all in all, when you look at those three trades, how do you assess the way the Nets, what they got for those players? I like what they got, but they thought they were getting the Ben Simmons of old, B. And again, this part is massive. Because they thought they were getting the Ben Simmons, who had been an all-star in Philly, who was going to come in with Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant and fill the roles that they were deficient in. That's why Steve Nash, dating back to the beginning of training camp, kept saying, I don't care if he shoots. Well, now they care. (laughs) I mean, he's taking like one (laughs) or two shots a game. Uh, So I like bridges a lot cam johnson is going to help them the picks are going to be whatever they may be either in the future or as as assets into some other deal but to me i can't even get past simmons because you can't move him now unless you are attaching some of the picks that you just acquired well especially since you know that the teams know you have the picks yeah exactly i mean it to get off that deal and bobby marks said flat out that deal or or Ben Simmons contract. I mean, he just has no value right now in a trade uh, market. So they're going to have to put in what they just acquired after giving up their stars. The downfall of Ben Simmons career coupled with the Nets being at this crossroads with Kevin and Kyrie is a huge, huge part of this organization's uh, brief past with him and short-term future with whatever happens because by acquiring him as a max player and seeing that he is not anywhere close to that anymore it put the nets and continues to put them in a bind that is going to be very difficult to get out uh, from underneath and still try and compete and get better to get back to the title contention they thought they were in still three or four weeks ago Dave, what do you think about the return? I think they kind of went from scorched earth to supple ground to be able to make a pivot. Now, I think Nick makes a great point. If they want to get off of Simmons, some of that draft capital will have to be attached. You know, if they want to make it him someone else's puzzle to figure out. And so those seven first round picks might come down to five or or something like that. But they have young switchable pieces is what you need in today's NBA that, you know, theoretically you could grow with for the next three or four years that would take to turn this thing in the right direction. So there's a lot of unforeseen, but I think their starting point, you know, maybe they're a little bit behind the starting point because of the Simmons acquisition, but their starting point is you know, somewhat enviable when you're talking about where you'd want to begin a turnaround. It wouldn't surprise me if we'll have to see what Houston looks like. First off, where they end up drafting, what personnel changes they might make. I wouldn't be surprised if Brooklyn wants to maybe do a deal with Houston at some point with these, because, you know, these are players that every team could use to get the control of their drafts back. Because part of the situation that they're in right now, look, I mean, they prioritized getting players but also when you're trading guys like Durant and Kyrie you're you in you know you're getting both um but they can't afford to go town to zero they have to remain competitive because they don't control their their picks i mean but this is what happened before um Prokhorov got tired of spending money and he said forget it we're done and they sunk down to the bottom and the and the and the Celtics benefited from it so now they're going to try to remain competitive and so i think they're kind of stuck in the middle they have a bunch of nice pieces and they're going to be right in the middle and they may be happy about their team from night to night, but I don't see how this team strikes a fear in anybody. And that's the thing. I don't, I'm, I'm very bullish on Mikhail Bridges for being more than he's shown and he has shown it this year. Um, but I don't think any of these players are guys who I think are high upside players um, or like they could turn into a special player uh, who could 
be a difference maker. I think they're going to be right back on the lookout for the difference maker. Um, and Nick, I don't even know how much longer you're going to be covering them. <laughs> that was, that was our little internal thing. Like, Oh my God, what's going to happen with Nick? Poor Nick went from Chicago to San Francisco to Brooklyn. And now what? I think that question is still being figured out as we speak. I think you're right right, right now, because I don't even know if our, uh, if our if our bosses have figured out the question that I've been wondering for three yeah. or four days. Well, we haven't. I mean, we did not foresee Kevin Durant being a son. Uh, I think that's fair to say. Uh, all right, Dave. Well, good luck on the Super Bowl today, Nick. Good luck with your life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the biggest smile I've seen my boy McTend <laughs> have in a while. Oh, he loves. Well, I am. <laughs> I think knew, how I, much more if you if you get shipped with KD out to uh, out to Phoenix, think how much more you're going to see your buddy McTen. Oh, it'll, it'll be will. great. It'll be like, too bad, too bad Cowboy Child's closed down, baby. We'd be there. No, I know we've we've Early been living on. in Old Scottsdale. They got a couple of uh, they, they got a couple of uh, Mastros though. We can get some butter cake somewhere. Sit at the bar, hang out. All right. Well, thank you to Jackson, our producer. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening to the Hoop Collective. We'll be talking to you in a couple of days.